This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. All rise, this hearing is in session. We are currently doing Literary Treks number 286. I will be your presiding officer, Dan Gunther, but joining me is another presiding officer, Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how's it going? I object. Oh, wait. <laughs> no, wait, I... no, no, that's there. What? <laughs> I guess I, I, no, I don't object to being here. I like being here. Sustain. No, overruled. Anyway, um, yeah. Hi, Dan. How's it going? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. So, um, as you may have been able to tell from that interesting beginning, uh, we're going to be doing a book that features a lot of court procedures and, and hearing stuff today. Uh, we are going to be talking about the new Star Trek The Next Generation novel, Collateral Damage by David Mack. And joining us to talk about it in the feature is the author himself. So very excited for that. But before we get to that, we don't have any news to share today, but we do want to go through some of the listener feedback from the Babel Conference for Literary Treks 284, Smoothing Over the Rough Edges of Canon. That was our discussion on the next generation novel, Greater Than the Sum by Christopher L. Bennett. So let's pop over to the Babel conference and see what you guys had to say. So we kick off with Matt Rushing's comment, and he says, another super boring cover. Yeah, I mean, okay, so this cover, it's not the most exciting, but I have to say, I always kind of liked it. I love the Enterprise E, and I think this is gorgeous. It is unfortunate it doesn't have anything really to do with the plot of the novel, doesn't say anything about what's happening in the book, but... Gosh darn it, that's a beautiful ship. Yeah, I've always liked the cover. It's not like a favorite cover of mine or anything, but I never found it to be boring. I just, I like looking at uh, this angle of the Enterprise E and the clouds and the purple sky behind it. I mean, I think it's a nice cover. I'm, I mean, And for me to say, oh, it's a nice cover, probably does sound boring. So maybe it is a boring cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the most exciting. So yeah, I, I get that. But I, I think it's pretty. And then we got another comment here from Andrew Kuderman who says, want to get my comment in early. So I haven't listened yet. This is my first ever Star Trek book. I picked it up because it had the Enterprise on the cover. Aha, there you go. And I like the look of the Enterprise. There you go. I kind of mm -hmm. like this book, especially since it's such a good jumping off point to destiny. Plus, LeBenzin makes a fool of himself, which is always good. <laughs> yeah, yes. he dooms everyone. He so does. That's great. He's not a major character, but he does leave a lasting impression in the book. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Justin Ozer says, I loved this novel. From the intro of one of my favorite novel verse characters, Teresa Chen, to the intro of another favorite character, Jasminder Chowdhury, who, in addition to being an unorthodox security chief, has some amazing philosophical conversations, to some great character work with Picard and Crusher, to the absolutely fascinating alien entity, to seeing Hugh and Guinan, both of which were great surprises, to a great Borg story that really helps to explain so much of what we've seen before, and 
I just loved this novel from start to finish. I'm also very excited now to reread Destiny now that I've read this as a lead up. I'd give greater than the sum 10 out of 10 transphasic torpedoes. Wow. Wow. Justin, did you like the cover? <laughs> <laughs> And Jeremy Campbell says, I think this book got me back on track in terms of being excited for the big build up to destiny. It also, in some ways, felt like a palate cleanser after a couple of mediocre novels, just in my opinion. Um, yeah, okay. I don't know. I like the novels before this. Oh, uh, yeah. No, wait. He's right. Some of these we didn't feel out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say not just in his opinion, but... uh that's that's pretty negative for me, so I'll just move <laughs> on. Oz Trekkie says, This is a great novel as I think it expertly bridges the gap between the previous Borg novels to the Destiny trilogy. Christopher L. Bennett is a master of the continuity explanations. You can really see the depth of detail and thought he goes into in his novels. His annotations for each novel are a good read, too. Actually, yeah, I'm going to interject here and say, go check out Christopher L. Bennett's website. Uh, I think it's ChristopherLBennett.wordpress.com, but just do a Google search for the author's name. And he has annotations for all the novels he's written, usually put out a couple months after they're released. So those are great. Thanks for pointing that out. Ostrecki goes on to say, I loved the story, the new characters, and the ending, poor Lebenzen. The only jarring note for me was Picard and Crusher married without any fanfare. I know the short story Q are cordially uninvited went into more detail, but I thought it odd there wasn't more fanfare in this first instance. I give this 4.5 no angels popping in to watch your after hours activities. Ooh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and Kimberly Lawler says, I know I checked this book out from the library when it came out, but I have no recollection of reading it, which is really unusual for me. Much greater appreciation for it this time around. I like Bennett's writing style, like Chen a lot, really like the character work, including with Guinan. And it's a tense story leading into Destiny. Good episode, guys. Thanks. Are you going to handle the Destiny reread in one episode or spread it out? Just curious. Well, Kimberly, I will not answer that question. I'll meet, leave it in mystery. No, I'm kidding. I'll, of course, I'm going to tell you, uh, which I'm glad you brought up. Perfect timing. Yes, we're going to do it in three episodes book one book two and book three and uh that's coming up here very 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 shortly <laughs> yeah um i was looking at the calendar and i kind of didn't realize how quickly we were going to get into destiny so yeah that's all going to come very soon which is also written by david mack who's here on the show yeah maybe we'll uh Maybe we'll ask him if he wants to. Ah, I don't know. We'll figure yeah, something out. Yeah. We'll probably just throw something together last minute. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, speaking of David Mack, what do you say we pop over to the feature and welcome him in and talk about collateral damage? I'm ready to pop. Well, once you pop, the fun don't stop. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as we mentioned at the top of the show, today we're talking about the Next Generation Collateral Damage by David Mack. And joining us to talk about this novel, and I'm really excited for this discussion, is the author himself, David Mack. Welcome back to Literary Tracks. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be back. Awesome. We're always happy to have you on the show. And uh, especially for, you know, what has become a momentous occasion of a new Star Trek novel. And this one in particular, I think, might be of... Um, import or a milestone i mean they're all important they're all great but this one in particular really feels like uh, i don't want to say end of an era but you know there's definitely a transition coming yeah dan what are you talking about what it's not the it's not the end of an era <laughs> we're, we're not done yet no certainly not well, what does that mean not. you're not done yet well those of us who are writing the books may or may not still have a few rabbits to pull from hats well, I, and I know you probably can't elaborate a lot, but I did want to bring up the tweet that you sent out uh, quite a, a few weeks back now uh, saying, you know, novel readers, don't worry, we have a plan. And uh, so that really kind of reverberated through the small niche of a niche of Trek fandom that is the the, the big fans of the novels. What exactly did you mean by that? Like, what can you tell us? Well, 
Not much, as I'm sure there is still a, uh, a sniper watching my window. There's probably <laughs> explosives planted at the uh, internet connection outside my house. But uh, I think what has already been stated to a certain degree online by Dayton Ward uh, is that uh, there are conversations going on about how we want to handle the change in focus at the, at the uh, on the novel side from what we've been doing since roughly 2001, give or take, to where we need to start taking the novels now that there are going to be new shows reestablishing new continuity in the 24th century, specifically Picard, and to a lesser degree, shows like Lower Decks, which is going to be uh, you know, part of the modern era of Star Trek. So we need to start thinking about where are we going to take the stories? How are we going to make the new books that start coming out after those shows compatible with those shows? And what does that mean for the work that we've been doing for the last 16 or 17 years? So that's a big question. Uh, it's a very complicated undertaking. What we didn't want to do was simply have everything screech to a halt the way, for instance, Star Wars just slammed on the brakes on its tie-in program after many years of telling people that it was a certain level of canon or whatnot. And then suddenly it all became Star Trek Legends, to a certain degree apocrypha, but still might be mined for details by new canon productions. But the stuff they had been working on just sort of abruptly stopped. And then they shifted gears and began writing new material to fit the new uh, media products that were coming out. Star Trek could have done that. Uh, for all I know, we may yet still just do that. It's not entirely clear. But those of us who write the books would like to try and find a more elegant way to transition. Rather than just slamming on the brakes and getting into a different car, uh, you know, we want to try and uh, you know, arrange some sort of a really fancy multi-car stunt. So with this novel, we have a number of storylines that have been kind of uh, brewing from very early on, going all the way back to the A Time To series, most notably. And the second and third last books of that series that you wrote, uh, the events of those tie in very... Um, They're integral to the story, yes. Very much so, Yeah. Uh, so we're going to get into spoilers a little bit later, but just in kind of broad terms, um, what was it like kind of going back and tying up those loose ends and bringing them forward and also wrapping up the whole section 31 continuity from your most recent novel as well? I knew from the beginning, it was going to be a very large and complicated undertaking. I was asked by the editor and the licensor to come up with a storyline for Picard that would deal with the fallout of what I unleashed in my novel Section 31 Control, in which Section 31's crimes, and in fact its very existence, are publicly exposed to the Federation at large as well as its interstellar neighbors. And uh, part of the fallout from that is that they found out that, you know, there's been a slightly malevolent artificial superintelligence called Control that's been pulling the levers of power in the Federation for close to two centuries. That's kind of a shock to the system and a massive political scandal. And then you couple that with the fact that all of Section 31's secret files have now been dumped sort of in a, you know, a, an Edward Snowden WikiLeaks sort of a situation to the public at large. And all of a sudden, people are realizing that Section 31 has been behind some truly heinous things. I mean, from what they did to the changelings during the Dominion War, to the dirty tricks they pulled on allies uh, and rivals in local space, to the fact that they were involved in the forcible removal from office of a sitting Federation president, Min Zeif, and that a number of very high-ranking and prominent Starfleet officers, many of them members of the Admiralty, were directly involved in that incident to varying degrees of criminal culpability. As a result, Jean-Luc Picard, who at this point is a very well-known and sort of beloved hero of the Federation for the role he played during the Borg crisis of 1981, uh, not 1981, 2381, um, the fact that he has saved the Federation from how many threats at this point, the man is beloved. You know, he's, he's sort of a hero. He's almost like Eisenhower after World War II. 
And suddenly his name is being dragged through the mud as having been involved in this uh, conspiracy, one might call it, to remove a sitting president without proper political or legal due process. And this is, a, again, a terrible PR moment for Starfleet. It's a political shock for the Federation. And it's something that they try to shield Picard from for as long as possible, which is why we see in the novels uh, Hearts and Minds and Available Light, both by Dayton Ward. Starfleet is trying to keep Picard out of the crossfire when the news first breaks. But at a certain point, by the end of Available Light, it becomes very clear that there is no way they can avoid putting him in the hot seat. He's going to have to come back and answer for his role. By the uh, beginning of Available Light, you know, they started rounding up the members of the Admiralty who were involved who are still alive. And uh, some of them run, some of them don't. Some of them wind up dead by the end of Available Light, assassinated through various means. But some are just waiting to testify and face the music. So... I was looking at the sheer scope of the story. I'm dealing with political fallout. I'm dealing with social fallout. I'm dealing with crimes that in story time are now six or seven years in the past for our characters. And for readers, these are things that happened in books published 15 years ago. A Time to wow. Kill and A Time to Heal came out in September and October of 2004. They were actually my first full-length paperback novels for Star Trek. Um, so in a way I was being asked to sort of go back to the very beginning of my Star Trek literary career and as an author answer for the narrative that I spun and unleashed, uh, in the, a time Two books. So just as Picard is being made to answer for what he did in a certain editorial sense, I was being asked to answer for what I did. I kind of. That's it's interesting you say that because I kind of uh, got that feeling very early on in the book. Uh, there was I, I forget the line and I thought I had it highlighted in in my ebook copy here, but uh, there was something about it's just something struck me as almost an out of universe line. You could take it out of universe that like oh we have to go back and deal with this stuff kind of thing. And I thought that was really funny, but uh, I, I well, wish I was more prepared on that. No, I understand. And uh, I think there was a line in there somewhere, maybe about, uh, you know, certain people were just never going to be happy no matter what answer you gave them. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, did you ever feel like you would eventually answer that question back in those books, ever revisit them? Or is that something you plan to do at some point? Not really. Uh, at the time, I had no idea the level of impact it was going to have. I also, at the time that I wrote A Time to Kill and A Time to Heal, I didn't know specifically how it was going to be followed up by other authors. It was not supposed to be such an obvious, ham-fisted and stupidly executed uh, plot that removed Min Zeif. The whole thing was supposed to be sub rosa, handled behind closed doors, he makes a sort of public statement of, you know, I was the right commander in chief for, you know, a time of war, but I can't lead as well in peace. And it's time for other more competent hands to steer the ship, which was, you know, a very nice way for him to leave office. And although it is implied at the end of A Time to Heal that he's being marched away to face uh, a gruesome fate, if he had, if anyone had bothered to ask me, how will this be handled for the sake of the public and the Federation? I'd say, well, probably Section 31 will set up a doppelganger for him who will go into retirement, show up at state events, funerals, whatever, cut a few ribbons on supermarket openings, uh, wave his hands at a few parades, but never actually grant any more public interviews. But they certainly would not want it to be as obvious as a former sitting president suddenly drops off the face of the universe and is never seen again because that raises questions. And yet somehow one of my fellow authors who shall remain nameless turned the whole thing into quite the uh, clumsy bungle by section 31, who I would have thought would be more competent. And consequently we were all forced to deal with that level of sloppiness that uh, another author decided to impose on the crisis post facto. Uh, it's not the direction I would have gone, but in a way I suppose it makes more sense in that it created a more dramatic situation, one that could be exploited for 
more narrative conflict uh, and higher stakes for our characters, of course. So um, I forgot what the original question was at this point because I've rambled so long. Well, no, you answered it because I was asking if you ever thought you'd go back to those books. No, I never thought I'd come back to this. I thought once we've got a couple of years of real time between us and the Time 2 books, and we started moving on and exploring other narratives, and especially once we got to Destiny. Uh, Destiny was sort of the point at which all of the ongoing Star Trek shared literary continuity converged in the fall of 2008. And it was the point from which it all diverged when it was done. And that sort of became the 800-pound literary gorilla driving the Star Trek literary uh, franchise afterward. And it's so overshadowed in many ways the events of the A Time 2 books that I felt like, well, the A Time 2 books events are forgotten. They've been buried under interstellar tragedy uh, of epic proportions, and any evidence has probably been blown away, and it's gone. And then somehow we just kept cycling back to it. And <laughs> as we started ramping up the Section 31 narrative, and I realized that at a certain point, people were going to want closure on that storyline and not just getting jerked around watching Bashir suffer for no good reason book after book. I realized, well, if we're going to take out Section 31, it, it's got to be big, it's got to be public, and it's got to make a mess. I mean, unlike Destiny, where I you know, literally vaporized planet after planet, blew away 60 billion souls – this isn't the same level of body count, certainly not the same level of physical damage to infrastructure, but the level of political and cultural damage that was done by the exposure of Section 31 and specifically the control entity is massive. Uh, and it resulted in yet another cleanup uh, on Isle Mac uh, for my <laughs> fellow authors to deal with and eventually in collateral damage for me to deal with. And as I'm sure you've noticed, the title collateral damage uh, it applies not only to the political fallout from Section 31 uh, coming back to haunt Picard after all these years, but it applies to the Nausicans who, as a culture and their world specifically, were literally collateral damage of the Borg invasion of 2381. Right. So you've not only revisited A Time 2, but you've revisited Destiny in this book, which is great because we're actually hitting the Destiny trilogy next month here on the show. Okay. And we read the Time 2 series last year. We've gone, been going through the post-Nemesis book. So the timing of this novel for us on the show is like perfect. And you, you're right. It's like tying it all together. It's like a Dave Mack Greatest Hits compilation album. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's got a Time 2. It's got Section 31. It ties into Destiny. It ties into Titan. Um it ties into pretty much all of the 24th century Star Trek storytelling work I have been doing uh, pretty much since I began writing narrative fiction uh, for Star Trek back in uh, 2001. What I mean, that's uh, there's a lot there and a lot of really great stuff to kind of mine and, and kind of going back to something that, that Bruce was uh, talking about there um, going back to the very beginning and uh, that you'd never expected to do that. I, I did find, and I'm probably reading way too much into this, but it's very early on in chapter one when Akaar is uh, meeting with Picard for the first time. And Akaar says to him, so it begins. He looked at Picard. You will never know how dearly I'd hoped this day would never come. <laughs> and I'm probably re reading way too much into that, but I'm like, oh, here we go. We've got to deal with all of this stuff now. And I, that felt almost out of universe to me uh, as well as in universe, which, you know, I can definitely appreciate. <laughs> well, it was mostly just a call back to what Dayton Ward had been doing with Akaar and Picard. They'd had a number of conversations where they danced around the grim truth where Akaar wanted to ask Picard exactly what the hell happened, but he knew that for both their sakes, for legal jeopardy, reasons of de plausible deniability, he couldn't really ask Picard directly and he did try to shield Picard from these consequences for as long as he could by simply putting light years of distance between Picard and the, uh, the tribunals. But at a certain point, he just ran out of road and he said, that's it. You got to come back. And Picard said, that's fine. I'm done running anyway. Let's let's face this head on. And if I did something wrong and you know, if uh, if the powers that be decide that uh, I, I, I crossed the line, so be it. I'll pay the price. 
Well, as you kind of mentioned, there are uh, two distinct storylines going on here. We have what's going on with Picard and, of course, as well, the Nausicans, as was mentioned. So we have uh, the Nausicaan homeworld, which had been devastated by the Borg. And we have this group of Nausicaans who are kind of determined to build their world back up, you know, stealing parts and, and equipment and supplies that they need. Now, I read an interesting piece that you had wrote on Star Trek.com about what kind of influenced this story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit to that, because I thought that was really fascinating. Well, yeah, part of the inspiration for this, and it's something I've been thinking about for a while before the editors asked me to do the Picard storyline, was when I saw the damage that Hurricane Maria inflicted on Puerto Rico, which is a, a sovereign U.S. territory, and its people are American citizens, and I saw the slapdash, uh, ham-fisted, completely incompetent response by the federal government that left so many people without power, without potable water, uh, without medical supplies, and not taking into account the value of Puerto Rico to the United States, which is that it's one of the pri uh, premier uh, producers of things like sterile saline for surgical applications. We need Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not just some forgettable uh, patch of land in the Caribbean. Puerto Rico is vital to U.S. strategic interests and to neglect it in the way that they did was maddening. And so I found myself thinking, all right, how do you translate that into Star Trek? And I realized the larger question there was, what are the obligations of a superpower, whether it's a global superpower like the United States on Earth today or the Federation as an interstellar superpower in the future? What are the obligations of a superpower, not only to its own citizens, its own territories, its own planets, but those of its allies, and maybe even those of its rivals in times of great disaster, times of great need. If you're going to talk the talk about being this great benevolent power that does good things, but then you don't follow through and you fail to live up to your own words, if you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk, well, then what good is all your talk? As I put in uh, the epigraph at the beginning of the book, I summed up this thought very simply as charity begins at home, but if it ends there, what good is it? Mm -hmm. And it's a very important message. And, and I, one, I'm really glad uh, that you communicate so well in this book. I mean, you know, people dismiss tie in fiction and Star Trek books and stuff, but you have some really important things to say here. And I'm glad you have the chance to say them because absolutely agree. <laughs> Well, thank you. I mean, that, that was, for me, one of the most important things about writing this book was to interrogate the concept of what are the obligations of a supposedly powerful and benevolent nation. Um, in this case, we find that while the Federation has been pretty good about responding to the crisis on its own worlds, especially very pretty worlds like Risa or Deneva, repairing damage on important political home worlds like Vulcan and Telar and uh, Andor, uh, we find that when it comes to something like Nausicaa, uh, who, you know, as a people, they were always standoffish, they were belligerent, they were politically independent, they didn't align with us or anybody else. Um, you know, they, they pride themselves on their strength, uh, on their individual, uh, you know, on their sovereignty, let's say. But when they take a hit like this, when the Borg incinerate their whole planet, probably kill 70% or more of all Nausicaans in the universe in one shot and there's nothing left there's no nausican government no nausican military no nausican economy nothing they got nothing left as it's said you know as we say right in the book and I, I went and i made sure to check with other authors i looked for other references to see if anybody had done anything like people visiting nausicaa or whatever and i found nobody had ever followed up on this particular story thread in a, in a lot of ways those of us who write the star trek books forgot about Nausicaa as much as the Federation did. And that was on us. And I realized, you know, in the years since the Borg laid waste to all this and the Federation has been talking all this grand talk about rebuilding, nobody ever set foot on this world. Not one relief ship, not one shipment of medical aid, not one attempt at terraforming, no rescue. Nobody mounted a defense of this planet. We sent ships to defend every other piece of rock. You know, we defended, you know, Klingon rocks, Romulan rocks, every, everything out there under the, uh, you know, uh, under the stars. But Nausicaa, 
it got left undefended. Nobody came to protect it. Nobody came to help it afterward. And when Worf realizes this, when this is laid at Worf's feet, as a Klingon, as someone who prides himself on honorable behavior and being associated with the Federation as an honorable entity, he feels shame. He is deeply ashamed at what he finds his, uh, you know, his people, his nation has failed to do. The, the neglect to him is a massive moral failing uh, and one that he takes very personally. Yeah, and to me, it almost sounds as if, as if this isn't over because, I mean, I do feel like there's some people that need to be responsible for not responding. And it is almost as surprising to me that the Federation wouldn't respond to the needs of the Nosigans. But you're right. Well, the, it, well, the always, problem, well, they never asked for help is the other problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. So some of the blame, in a sense, is, is on them, too. And they but should who, have asked for but help. Who, but who was going to ask for help? There was no government. That's true. Once the planet got cooked, they they weren't part of an interstellar alliance or anything. They thought like they had ambassadors anywhere. They just they got fried, and everyone said, "Well, I guess they're gone." So the actions that they took in this book, yeah, these are the last survivors. I mean, they had nobody left to speak for them. They have no political proxy anywhere. So did they take the right actions in this book? Do you think they did the wrong thing, but for the right reason? Which is interesting. Uh, Francois de la Rochefoucauld once said, uh, you know, the, the first crime is the greatest treason to do the right deed before the wrong reason. And this is sort of the inverse of that, doing the wrong deed for the right reason. They have a noble goal in mind, which is to try and restore their world. What they don't realize, of course, spoiler alert, it's a futile effort. Their world is destroyed beyond redemption. There's no bringing it back. Uh, terror, you could have all the terraforming tech you want. That planet is screwed. It ain't coming back. Um, but they don't realize it. They're not exactly the most tech-savvy guys in the world, and they don't really have a deep bench of, of talent to call on at this stage. They have whoever simply happened to be off-world at the time their home world was blown to bits. So they don't realize that they are basically trying to push a boulder up a mountain here. The, the part of the novel where... Worf is asking Chen to kind of give the the like rundown of what happened to Nausicaa. That to me just like gave me a feeling like this pit in my stomach where uh you know he asks like did Nausicaa send a distress call and Chen says six hours before the attack and basically that entire time between then then and the attack they kept sending distress calls. Well who responded? Nobody responded. Who visited Nausicaa in the interim? No one. And she can't even look at him. And it's just like And when they, so have, to admit, we're, they have to admit, we're the first Federation ship to come here since this planet was destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's been seven years. We're the first ones to come here. And that's the moment where the bottom just falls out for Worf. I mean, that's the point where you realize we are schmucks of the First Order. <laughs> so, uh... Just kind of going back to the Nausicans for a little bit, mm -hmm. this kind of, uh, I know you've kind of expanded on the Nausicans yourself in other novels, uh, notably, I think, the Titan novel Fortune of War. And a lot of that, I'm assuming, is based on Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind with the Four Winds. Am I right about that? Yeah, and that actually goes back to my DS9 novel Warpath, written in oh, 2007. Okay. Um, I had a, a character in there who, and a lot of the little things you see about the Nausicans in Collateral Damage were established with a, char a Nausicaan character I wrote in Warpath. A char that character in the book, he was a bounty hunter. He was a Venolar, a snowblood, as they say. Not hot-blooded uh, like your average Nausicaan, but cool, cold, sociopathic almost, calculating, uh, you know, not prone to fits of rage, but rather to just cold reactions, ruthless, cold-blooded, uh, you know, thinking. Because you need some of those in every society uh, for various functions. Uh, in ours, apparently, they're politicians. Um, but so I had established that. I'd established the whole thing about the worship of the four winds. And that was a uh, an homage to the fact that the Nausicaan species was named after uh, Hayao, uh, what's his last name? Miyazaki? Um, Miyazaki, I think, yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was they named the species as an homage to that famous uh, Japanese uh, film, animated film. Uh, so I incorporated the notion of the four winds as the notion of this uh, 
deity, this, this divine presence that inspires uh, the Noskins. They believe in something we would call a soul, which they call a tegol, uh, plural tegoli. And so they have this. And then I expanded a little bit on this in Collateral Damage, where you find that they call their sort of religious leader Windfather. Uh, hmm. And they basically build the temple to the winds on top of whatever is the highest peak on their home world. And now when they, at the end of the story, spoiler alert, uh, when they settle someplace new, they find its highest peak. And this is where they set the foundation for what will be the new temple of the four winds. Yeah, because I think from the shows, all we ever really got from the Nausicaans was the idea of garamba, which, you know, you can translate as balls. guts or balls, I guess. Yeah. Balls. Yeah. Balls. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Garamba is great, but it makes the Nausicans a little one note. One of the things I had mm -hmm. fun with writing the Nausicans was that when they're dealing with non Nausicans, they come off as the monosyllabic brutes we remember. When they're talking amongst themselves, ostensibly in their native language, they are as eloquent uh, as anybody else. It's just we don't get it. When they try to talk to us in standard, which is a strange language for them. Maybe they don't like universal translators and maybe the universal translator just doesn't like their language. Yeah. It doesn't represent them right. It doesn't represent mm -hmm. them. Well, I mean, this could be a situation much like today that, you know how they have those uh, sensors that are supposed to automatically turn on water or dispense soap in bathrooms. And they've shown that sometimes because of the way they're made, when people with dark skin try to use those the sensors don't acknowledge them as people and won't either turn on the water or dispense the soap there's an inherent racist bias in some of this automated soap and water technology because the people who made it were all a bunch of white silicon valley jerk offs who never thought hey maybe somebody with a different skin tone needs to use this stupid thing well maybe the people who made the universal translator had a little bit of the same cultural blind spot and they think it's a marvelous piece of technology but it doesn't work so well for some languages. Maybe the Noskins end up coming off like brutes because nobody ever bothered to properly calibrate the universal translator for them. Or maybe they're yeah. just jerks. I don't know. <laughs> but I like the idea of them being more rounded as a culture, you know, that they, they have their mates, they have their faith, uh, they have their social structure. Uh, their chief failing maybe as a species was pride. They were too proud to ask for help too proud to show deference to an outsider, uh, you know, much in the same way that, you know, feudal Japan regarded outsiders, you know, gaijin uh, as something to be scorned uh, and people with whom contact should be avoided. Maybe that's the Nausicaan part of the Nausicaan problem. Maybe they just were too proud of their own culture and too dismissive of outsiders. And as a result, they just uh, didn't get represented well in the universal translator because they wouldn't cooperate uh, you know, they didn't join any federations or alliances or anything because they like being on their own. They don't like being part of something. They like running their own show. But they found out the hard way that what that means is when the wolf comes to your door, there's nobody there to help you. Well, and they also don't want another world. They want to try to save the world that they're from, and they're not willing to go somewhere else and colonize and well, they don't. Re well, they also don't realize uh, they're they're trying to save their world because they have a you know an emotional attachment because right. it's their world. Like humans wouldn't try to save Earth, wouldn't try to rebuild. It's only when someone comes along and really lays down the hard, cold facts to say, "This ball of rock ain't coming back. This thing is dead because of this mistake, this mistake, and this mistake. These things all added up. You can't save this planet." Right. Okay. Science tells the truth. Science science tells you cold, hard facts you don't want to hear. And the cold, hard facts were, we're sorry, guys. Your planet ain't coming back. We cannot terraform this thing. It is too badly damaged, too heavily irradiated. It is too poisoned. There's just no bringing this back. You got to start over. And that's, a, mm -hmm. that, that, that's something the Noskins don't want to hear. And that's, again, part of the problem. They don't like being told things they don't want to hear. But who does? Well, speaking a, a little bit more about the Nausicans as well as another character uh, in this novel, uh, we do see, like you said, when the Nausicans are around Nausicans, they speak just as eloquently or, or as full heartedly as anyone else does. But there's also another difference when we get a chapter from the perspective of Kynagar. 
and uh, in and as well as another character who we'll talk a little bit about. But you switch to a first person narrative, and in, especially in the case of Kynagar, it's in present tense, mm-hmm. and you go into a little bit in that of that in the uh, acknowledgments as to the reason for that, which I thought was really fascinating. I was curious, was that aspect of the novel more challenging to write? And were there kind of any major changes in your approach in order to make that work? It wasn't more challenging. In fact, if anything, it was more fun. I found it Mm. at times liberating. I found that when I was writing the sections that were in first person, that they went a lot faster than the sections I was writing in third person. Uh, They felt more spontaneous to me as I was writing them. That's funny because when I was reading it, I felt the first person read faster for me too. Which is interesting because some fans have responded by saying they found the first person segments to be uh, clunky and they, they weren't able to read them as quickly because they found the change jarring. And I understand finding the change jarring. Switching verb tense and point of view style uh, can be a jarring thing, but I always tried to make it as clear as possible whose point of view we were in. And by keeping it consistently first person present tense for Kinegar and first person past tense for Thady and Okana, that I thought people would eventually begin to figure out, okay, it's first person, it's past tense. I'm with Okana now. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I explained, you know, as you said, in the acknowledgements for Kinegar, the reason he's in first person present tense is that this is a guy who feels like he has been cut off from his past and he has no reason to believe he has a future. He lives in the ever present now. He is living his life in the moment, going from moment to moment, almost as if he's adrift, as if he's lost. Whereas Okana, he is in first person past tense because he likes to think of himself as the hero narrating his own story for posterity. He believes his own hype just a little bit too much. Uh, But if you get into his point of view and you start following along, you begin to realize this is a guy who, after a couple of decades of this type of work, he's burned out. He's banged up. He's coming to the end of his rope. He maybe doesn't have that many good years left, and he knows it. And he's starting to have doubts. Um, But part of what inspired this, and I mentioned this in the acknowledgments, was a a novel called The Monster Baru Cormorant by Seth Dickinson, uh, which came out... uh, I think late last year, maybe early this year, uh, I read it and I just love that book so much. And Seth used exactly this approach where for two particular characters, he set apart their sections of the novel with first person present for one and first person past for the other. And I eventually talked with him about it and, uh, you know, sort of plumbed his uh, literary rationale. And I was so taken with it that I couldn't help but want to play with it as a literary device myself just to see how it would work. And I realize it's unusual for a Star Trek novel to do something this literarily weird with styling and it doesn't work for everybody. I know that some of the reviews I've already seen on like Amazon or wherever people are, uh, you know, dinging me a couple of stars, taking a couple of stars off the review because they don't like it and they think it's too weird and too avant garde. But, you know, I got to take chances. Uh, This was my 28th Star Trek novel. Uh, At a certain point, you write enough of these things, you begin to want to do something just to make it different from what you've done before. And daring to try and mix in uh, this sort of, you know, literary mashup of point of view and verb tense, uh, maybe as a sort of a, a shock to the reader's perception as they're going through the book, Maybe not all readers are into that, but I'm hoping some readers will be because I found it fun. I found it liberating. Uh, and I just thought it was an experiment worth trying. I like, I mean, I liked it because I like to see something different like that. And I will admit, mm-hmm. as soon as I started, I was like, I'm, I'm, wait, what, what's going on here? I'm a little confused why we're switching formats and the narrative. But once I started seeing where it was going and how it was, ha- like, I actually was welcoming it. Like I, when I would get to that first person narrative, I was excited about it because I knew what character we were hitting and we're getting inside this character's mind and hearing it from their standpoint. So once that rhythm happened, it really started to flow for me. And then I kept wondering like, why these two characters, why did you choose those two for the first person narrative and not another? Well, I think it's because they were the guest characters, uh, but they were both important to the narrative in their own way. Uh, 
Kinnegar is vital because he's our chief antagonist and he's the one who, although we cast him as a villain, you eventually find out that he's the hero to his own people. And in his story, he's the hero. He's the one who leads his people to something better. He's their Moses, who, unlike Moses, actually gets to live to see the promised land. Uh, and then you have Thaddean O'Connor, Thaddean O'Connor, uh, who, again, he sees himself as the hero of his own narrative, even though the success of his narrative depends on him failing. He's a failed hero, uh, but he's still sympathetic because some part of him wants to do good, um, even though he knows he's a, a bit of a rapscallion, let's say, a bit of a rascal, a scoundrel. Um <laughs> And, you know, he was a bit of a ladies' man, like when, when they first introduced him in the season two episode, The Outrageous Okana, on Star Trek The Next Generation. I mean, that guy went through the female members of the TNG, uh, you know, of the Enterprise crew, like a hot knife through butter. I mean, that guy just, every time he turned around, he had another girl on his arm. It's like, what? But, you know, I'm like, all right, I mean you go with it. It's Billy Campbell. So you, you roll with it. And uh, so I tried to have a little bit of that, you know, mystique, except of course that it doesn't work for him through most of the story until you get to that last bit at the end. And that's sort of like the last little hint of, yeah, he's getting a little old. He's getting a little slow. He's getting a little squidgy, but come on, you got that twinkle in his eye. He's still got it. He's still got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's also a member of Starfleet intelligence. He's an agent. I don't know. He got recruited. Ever- yeah. We didn't see that in any previous books, right? Or is this the no. first time we've seen that, right? No, I just pulled this out of thin air. I think the last time we saw him in the books, I think it might have been uh, an alternate universe thing, like maybe one of the myriad universes thing where they had a someone, one of the authors postulated a scenario in which Guinan was killed or otherwise lost and Thadian Okana took her place, uh, I guess, as like the bartender on the Enterprise D or something. Uh, I'm not entirely clear on that, but that didn't tie into the continuity at all. And when I researched the history of his character, uh, both in canon and in uh, beta canon, you know, in the novels and the comics, I found that aside from this alternate universe depiction of him, he had dropped off the map. He was up for grabs that I could essentially establish anything I really wanted about his history over the last couple of decades since we last saw him. And I realized he was such a, a fun Han Solo-ish character to have running around the Star Trek universe. Uh, I realized he would be a great candidate, uh, you know, for my, my rogue spy whose singular blunder at the beginning of the book sets the crisis in motion. So, uh, that was part of how I chose him to have the other first person perspective, because I also, I didn't want to favor any of the particular Star Trek characters over one another. So by attaching this literary experiment to the guest stars, uh, I kept parody uh, between all of the uh, series regulars and didn't like try to pull one out as the favorite, even though Picard clearly dominates the narrative. Well, regarding Okana, I, I at first when I was reading, I was kind of like, I don't know, do I buy this guy as a as a Starfleet intelligence asset? But then thinking back to that original episode he was in, he was kind of you know running interference between the son and daughter and mm-hmm. run you know keeping them hidden from the fathers and you know smuggling jewels for them and that sort of thing. He was so. basically brokering an interplanetary peace through uh, you know less than legal means. Exactly. Yeah. So very much in the wheelhouse of an undercover agent of some kind. So that, no, that's kind of cool. He's a noble scoundrel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So was the the reason you used that character just because you kind of liked the idea of that scoundrel type character or was there a kind of a deeper reason why him in particular? That grew out of my research at the time I was putting that storyline together. I was thinking about trying to pitch like a line of Starfleet intelligence novels. And I knew Mm. I was going to want a core character who would be the heart of it. And I'd have to build his little, you know, man with van team around him. Um, But I knew that it would be a hard sell coming up with a completely original character in that role, that the licensor and the editors were more likely to give me the green light. If I could find an established character from Canon, 
to pin the series on. So I went and I did a lot of research and I went through all the old episodes and eventually I stumbled upon Lady and Okana. And I realized there was a lot of unrealized potential there. Then when I had to go and build his team, I started poking around and I realized that Naomi Wildman might be a funny person to pair with him. Sam Lavelle, because he always had a bit of a stick up his butt. Um, <laughs> the trick with Naomi Wildman, of course, is that, you know, in the Voyager books, Kirsten Beyer had Naomi drop out of Starfleet Academy at some point, uh, turning her back on Starfleet. So I had to talk to Kirsten and make certain that it was okay with her and okay with the editors that at some point in the intervening years, after she does that in the Voyager books, at some point in the next couple of years, she comes around and changes her mind and is brought back into the fold. And I have to imagine it has something to do with the nature of intelligence work versus just being one of many uh, junior officers puttering around a starship. Well, I got to say, I would definitely read a book series that had these three characters working together. There's something really fun about their dynamic. And uh, I, I don't know. I, th I think there's definitely something here. So if you can convince them. <laughs> I don't think it's likely at this point. The focus at the Star Trek uh, publishing office seems to be on putting out titles that are going to directly connect to and promote the franchise uh, tent poles like Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Discovery. Uh, and then eventually they might find some way to tie something into uh, the kids show on Nickelodeon after it premieres in a couple of years. They, there'll probably be comic books that'll tie into lower decks. But I think that aside from the original series, which continues to uh, be very popular, uh, especially with hardcore longtime fans, uh, I think what we're probably going to see is the books are going to stay focused starting in 2020 or 2021. They're going to start focusing very tightly on uh, expanding what we know about the existing shows that are currently in production for CBS All Access. Which makes sense, I suppose. But uh... as a publishing strategy, it <laughs> seems to be where the the it's where the momentum is. It's where the fan interest is. Uh, the fans get invested in those series and in those characters and they want more books about them. And as a result, uh, that just seems to be where the momentum is. So I can certainly understand why they want to go that way. And it just seems like it's the wrong time to be pitching yet another, you know, start from scratch, try to do a startup series. I mean, we got away with it a couple of times with new frontier, with Vanguard, with Titan, but uh, you know, and and Starfleet Corps of Engineers, SCE, definitely as a monthly ebook series. But I think that the fact that Seekers petered out after four books uh, and that, you know, I, I think they're starting to see that fan interest is beginning to get much more tightly focused on things like Discovery and especially on Picard. I just uh, think it's unlikely that as long as there are new shows in production, I don't think that they're likely to create any literary original spin-off series so it has to be a waypoint comic to get these characters <laughs> together that would be a hard sell because they're not doing waypoint right now yeah <sighs> or uh you know continuing them to be special guest stars every once in a while in in other novels that would be definitely okay <laughs> well you, you never know you never know definitely actually uh i just the other night watched the voyager episode shattered unfortunately because i think that's an awful episode <laughs> but we do get a glimpse of naomi wildman in the future so yes. i was kind of able to paste that over you know and picture somebody uh for this novel so that was really cool yeah and <laughs> she and these characters get propelled 800 years in the future and you can read about that in a future discovery novel how's that hey there we go <laughs> i'm sorry that's that's a bad idea that's why you do the writing david and not me Imagine, imagine my poker face at this end of the conversation. <laughs> well, I think uh, we, we've gotten a little bit into spoilers and, and talked, you know, generally. A but bit. I, yeah, yeah, we're in there. We, we should probably have given a warning a little no, earlier. We got, David gave them a warning. We're good. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> and, hey, if well, they don't want to be spoiled anymore, go read the book. Definitely. We're going to be talking about kind of the end game of this whole thing now. So, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> but let's, let's do it. I wanted to talk specifically about the character of Worf. 
in this novel because man, he has come such a long way and I just absolutely love his journey in the novels. Uh, his development as a thoughtful and diplomatic Starfleet officer, you know, compared that to the early seasons of TNG and the fact that you end this with them saying like, yeah, he's ready for the captain's chair and it's probably going to get it soon. Like his solution to the Nausicaan crisis was great. We've got these uh, intelligence agents that are looking at the Nausicaans with their broken English and their brute force. Well, the only way to deal with them is to blow the whole thing up. And Worf is the one who manages a diplomatic solution and, you know, kind of has Starfleet atone a little bit for their negligence and uh, showing true compassion for the Nausicaans here. Uh, what's it like to kind of write Worf in this more thoughtful way? Because I'm really digging this guy and, and let's get that Captain Worf series going now. I thought the same thing. I'm glad you just said that. <laughs> well, I mean, this goes all the way back to a time too, where one of the chief questions that we were asking was how was Worf's life affected by the diplomatic posting that he takes at the end of the Deep Space Nine series? Because the last we saw of him when Deep Space Nine ended, he went off and became the Federation ambassador to the Klingon Empire. That's a pretty important diplomatic post. And usually it's given to a civilian. It's unusual to have a, a military officer you know, have to temporarily go on inactive status to uh, accept a diplomatic post, especially considering that, you know, his military rank was commander, but uh, an ambassador on a, a foreign planet is the equivalent of like a three or four star admiral in terms of diplomatic rank. But it was obviously because he had a strong personal connection to the House of Martok. He was a member of House of Martok, and that gave him tremendous political access and political leverage with the Klingon chancellor and therefore with the high council. Well, you don't get thrust into a, a political uh, arena like that and not learn some things. And I always found it a little disappointing that, you know, the TNG movies uh, suddenly reverse that, have him back in uniform on the bridge of the enterprise with no mention of what happened to the fact that he was a serving ambassador. How, why leave the ambassadorship? So that was part of the impetus behind the A Time Two books was to explore how and why Worf leaves the diplomatic post, but it changes him. The time that he spends working as a diplomat, you know, in, in ensconced in politics changes him. And then going through the Borg uh, invasion in 2381 changes him. Watching entire worlds burn before his eyes changes his entire relationship to war and violence. Uh, the relationship that he has with Jasmine Chowdhury before she dies, uh, spoiler alert, by the way, uh, at some point she dies. Um, but it changes him. She, she helps him you know, find that there are ways to think about the role of security and tactics that are about minimizing violence, that are about preventing violence. So his ethos changes over the course of several years as he becomes a more seasoned officer. And many fans, you know, like to bring up the uh, the episode of DS9 where he, you know, abandons his, you know, orders or his mission or whatever to go back for Jetzia. And Cisco says, you'll certainly never have a command of your own. And they go, well, Cisco said it. I'm like, yeah, but when Cisco said it, you know, Worf was a lieutenant commander. He had just made a major screw up. What happens within a year after that? He gets made an ambassador to the Klingon Empire. Which one do you think is the more prominent item on his curriculum vitae? Which one do you think <laughs> exactly, is exactly? Yeah. Which item do you think is at the top of this man's resume? Then you add to it a number of years as Picard's XO on the Enterprise. Man is first officer of the Enterprise in the books for many years, like six, seven years at least. Goes through war. Goes through adventure. Uh, you know, loses, uh, you know, another love of his life or whatever. He goes through all this stuff. He's got to come out on the other side more thoughtful, more mature, uh, you know, less prone to anger. This is this is not a young man anymore. This is now a man well into, you know, a, even though he's a Klingon, he's well into middle age at this point. This is a guy who has been seasoned by lots of life experience. He has attained wisdom. He is not some hothead who's going to pull a phaser just because he sees something on the monitor on the bridge. You know, he's past <laughs> that now. This is a guy who is going to sit back and think about things. He's going to be a cold, 
calculating tactician when he needs to be, but he's also going to be uh, an empathetic leader. He's going to be a big brother to officers, and that's what he needs to be. He's learned how to code switch. He has learned from his uh, shipmates of various species, you know, the humans, the betazoid, the trills. He's learned to be a more complex, a more rounded character. And so we were starting that even in a time, too, as we were exploring his role as a diplomat and how he came back to Starfleet. And we saw it again in, uh, especially in the Destiny trilogy, when, you know, he's dealing with uh, Jasminder Chowdhury, who is dealing with the death of her father, who was you know, one of the many who were lost on Deneva. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, she's planting some tree or whatever. She's like having a memory about the tree she planted with her father. And for some reason, thinking about that tree going up in flames has her ready to break down. And she feels so stupid. And it's Worf who says to her, you are not mourning the tree. You are mourning the memory of your father. And there is no shame in that. He has the gravitas now to be the father figure to a crew. And you know, so that's what we were showing in Destiny is he has achieved this level of soulfulness, this insight. Um, and we saw that through cold equations. Uh, and now, of course, you know, we see it come to a, a head here in collateral damage where he's supposed to be on a milk run, core systems patrol, you know, a, a do nothing, go round in circles kind of job until Picard gets back. And then a crisis hits. He wastes no time, shifts into action, puts his people to work. Does he go in shooting? No, because Picard has taught him not to do that. Assess the situation. Evaluate. Get the facts. Find out what the other guy's perspective is. Think about it from their point of view. Are you right? Are you still convinced you're right after you've seen it from the other side? And that's the kind of guy Worf has become. And that's why by the you know time he gets through all this and he realizes, you know, A, my own people have failed tragically uh, to live up to their ideals. These people should have been able to count on us and we screwed them. We certainly ignored them at the very least. Uh, and we owe them because we did bring this down on the quadrant. We certainly should have done better by them. Uh, and he uses his political clout from his ambassador days to reach out to his kinsman who just happens to be chancellor Martok. And he says, you know, throw me a bone here, help me out. And Martok's like, well, what's in it for me? He says, well, we're going to make it look like you're doing the Federation a humongous favor, and then they're going to be in your pocket and that'll help you keep the wolves at bay from the high council. And Martok's like, ah, you learned a few things as an ambassador, didn't you? All right. <laughs> And so that's that's the guy Worf has become. And it's no surprise. You pull off a major coup like that, you know, where you're able to manipulate a foreign government, your own government, uh, you know, put an end to a scourge of violence and do a humanitarian good deed all at the same time. Uh, don't be surprised if your name ends up on the short list for promotion. Well, it looks like he's also learned a lot from a previous first officer because it looks like he's going to poach another security officer to be his first officer on wherever he goes next, too. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying over the years to try and build something with the character of Shmarova since I introduced her back in the Destiny trilogy uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and even then, Shmarova's problem has always been a lack of self-confidence. She measures herself against far more accomplished officers and finds herself wanting because she won't cut herself a break. She has uh, father figure issues. She's got authority issues. Uh, but mostly what she has is just a, a lack of faith in herself. And Worf is able to sort of see these things because these are similar issues to what Worf had to deal with when he was coming up. Worf looks at her and sees somebody who he understands this is a potentially great officer. She just needs the right person to steer her in, you know, the direction that will help her become her best self. Worf sees that in her. And that's why when Picard suggests, you know, have you thought about, you know, who you might uh, tap for your XO? That's why Worf's eyes sort of shift to Shmarova. He's thinking she has potential. She could be great. She just needs the right person to take her under the wing and lead her there. So, I mean, that's a relationship I've been trying to build and explicate, uh, you know, for a decade. Uh, and 
Uh, I, I don't know if it's ever going to get a chance to pay off, but I hope it does. I think it will. I, you know, we, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, you're right. Because who knows what the future holds, but I like that we at least got this in this novel because I do feel like Worf has grown so much and their relationship is very evident in here. And this is the first time I really felt like, yeah, I'm ready to see Worf in his own command before I haven't been. And even like the, you know, you know, Michael Dorn talking about a, Worf series. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't know. But this novel actually want, makes me want to see or read something like that. So I don't well, know. That would, we'll that would, it would depend on whether or not that's how they do a Captain Worf series. I mean, some of the right. ideas I've seen bandied about have, you know, Worf as the constant butt of jokes and his misfit crew. And it sounds <laughs> like a complete debacle. Uh, I, I hope that, you know, if they were to ever seriously consider putting together a series of Captain Worf, uh, maybe that A, they wouldn't call it Captain Worf. Um, but B, <laughs> I would hope that maybe, just maybe, they would ask Kirsten Beyer and maybe me and maybe Dayton for a little bit of input because mm -hmm. Worf should not be a joke. Uh, Worf is a character who deserves some dignity and some gravitas. Uh, and my worry would be that if the TV team got a hold of it and was not aware of just how much that character has grown in the books that they might feel the need to sort of do it all over themselves by having this character, even though he's much older than he was still be less emotionally developed than he ought to be. And mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not like you say, we've gotten all this development for him in the books, but he's also like the character who's had the most hours of Star Trek devoted to him on television and film too. I mean, yeah. Star Trek's the story of Worf. That's that, my thesis. Ne I believe ne that. Next gen and DS9. <laughs> yeah. I mean, considering he came in from season four, so he has seven seasons of development on one show, four on another. He's got 11 seasons of time behind him. That's mm -hmm. huge. That's a big deal. <laughs> Definitely. Well, if Worf's the main character in one part of the story, we can't neglect, of course, the, the other main story going on here, which is, of course, uh, not the trial, the hearing of Picard uh, to de determine his culpability in this whole mess from Tezwa yeah. that led to the ouster of Min Zaif. Yeah. So I, I love these um, hearing room scenes and Philippe Louvois. <laughs> what a great character who, of course, was brought in as the attorney general in Dayton Ward's novel. But to see her here back in like uh, practicing law and butting up against Picard was a lot of fun. What was it like kind of writing that antagonism there? Well, a lot of fans who have been you know, sort of uh, reviewing the book or asking me about the book online since it came out have said, you know, why is Philippa Lavoie coming off as, you know, such a, a raging harridan? Why, why did I write her that way? And my thinking was that this is the sort of rage that one can have only when one has been bitterly disappointed by someone you thought well of. Because that's what's really driving the anger in Philippa Lavoie is the fact that she has to do this for Picard, of all people, even after everything that happened with the loss of the stargazer, where maybe she was a little rough on him during that court martial, after everything that you know they went through in measure of a man, she always had an affection and a respect for him. She held him in high regard. She believed the best of him, that he represented the best of Starfleet. And for her to have to put him through his paces in an Article 32 hearing, which is basically the equivalent of a criminal preliminary or pretrial hearing, the fact that she has to bring him up or, or try to bring him up on charges like treason, sedition, conspiracy to commit murder, uh, this is so upsetting to her because this would be like finding out that your hero, your idol, the person that you loved and respected and thought was the paragon of everything good has potentially, you don't know for sure, but you think has potentially betrayed everything that you hold dear, everything you've sworn to defend and uphold. And suddenly this person who you thought was right there with you, standing by your side, believing in and fighting for all the same things, suddenly you've got reason to believe, you've got reasonable suspicion that maybe this person has betrayed 
everything. And that, that comes with a, a level of anger, uh, a level of rage that can only happen when it's somebody who you cared about, who you liked, who you respected. And that's what comes down to the final confrontation, spoiler alert, between Louvois and Picard at the end of the book, which is when he faces off with her and it comes out, you know, she didn't want to believe that such a thing was possible. Uh, and even though, you know, he comes out of this uh, trial to one degree or another exonerated, she says, I can never look at you the same way again. And, you know, he's like, you know, neither can I, because he's never going to be able to look at himself in the mirror again the same way either. Yeah. She mm. even says, you know, I want to believe you and I want to trust you. But I, I thought that was a powerful scene because it's like, mm -hmm. she really, you're right. I felt like she was against him the whole time, but really she's on his side, but he has disappointed her and she doesn't really even know what to believe anymore. Yeah. This is when the person you most hope for, this is when your hero is the one who lets you down. And it's such a bitter pill to swallow. And then to have to be the one who goes in there to, to be the one who has to go and grill one's hero, somebody who she had this affection for as well as respect for. It's just, she, she's, she's sick to her soul over what this means and, and over the fact that Picard, even if he is technically exonerated, there's now always going to be this question mark. And as you know, as you pointed out, as she said, you know, I, I want to believe you. I want to trust you, but I don't know if I can. And, you know, Picard's like, well, I, I don't know either. Yeah. That scene was so powerful. And it, it was, it was kind of that, uh, that moment where I was like, Oh, okay, I get it. Like I get why she has been the way she is. And I, I think if you don't follow the book through to that scene, like it, it's going to bug you, but that, that scene really does make it all uh, come together there. And you realize what she's been going through and why she's been so dogged in this. Now, once you read that, you can suddenly realize you go back and look at all the earlier scenes. The subtext is all there. Mm -hmm. And it's just I, I don't like to hit readers over the head with what's inside each character's head. Uh, I try to make their actions consistent with what I know their emotional truth is. But sometimes I make you wait until the end of the book to find out what that was. And then that forces you to go back and reconsider and recontextualize the things that you've already uh, read and experienced in the narrative. Yeah, and, th and that hurt that she has is just like – when you realize that that's it's such a powerful moment for sure. Right. This, this, this would be like me finding out that, you know, uh, you know, Neil Peart of rush gave money to Trump. You know, it would just, Ugh. it would break my heart. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you think? What's Picard thinking of her in this scene? In that particular scene when they're yeah. facing off, I think what Picard is feeling and what he's thinking about is not so much, He's not disappointed in her. He understands why she had to do what she did. Picard at that point is more concerned with whether or not what she's saying about him is true. I think that some of his faith in himself is broken by this process. Um, he's no longer going to have this illusion of himself as the hero on the white horse. Uh, and maybe he never did. I mean, maybe after the whole Tesla crisis, he knew he was compromised and that's been sort of hanging over his head. But, you know, it, it felt like, you know, he got a shot at redemption with the whole Borg crisis where, you know, and even in the Borg crisis, you see some of that lingering guilt from Tesla manifest in the form of when he and Bev conceive their child and almost immediately afterward, the Borg invasion begins you know, he feels like, uh, you know, the the main character, the narrator in The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, who, he feels like, you know, he's shot the albatross in an act of hubris, and now he's being punished for it. He's made this one selfish choice to, you know, try and have a family, the thing that he had always said he would never do. He tries to have, you know, take a little bit of happiness for himself, and suddenly the universe seems like it's about to unravel. Well, God, you know, part of that guilt although it is tied to the death of, you know, his brother, Robert, his nephew, Rene, uh, although certainly there's certainly the anxiety of fatherhood, part of the guilt that's got to be eating away at him is the knowledge that he's only two years past the Tesla crisis at that point, maybe even less. 
uh, he's maybe a year and change. He's still got that floating around in the back of his head. He's got a free floating guilt anxiety complex that's going to haunt him for years until he gets put on that stand. And that's the reason he doesn't listen to his lawyer is that not, he's not just fanatically convinced of his own rightness. It's that part of him feels like if I'm going to be taken down for this, let it happen. Let it be now. He's tired of running. He's tired of dodging. He doesn't listen to legal advice because not just because he's, you know, convinced that he's, you know, beyond reproach, but because if he has to pay the price, he's ready to do it now and he just doesn't want to put it off anymore. Well, in this hearing, we do get uh, ultimately some exculpatory evidence thanks to Lahan and the efforts of Riker and Akka are behind the scenes. Uh, and she kind of brings this evidence that uh, clears him from, you know, the the main parts of the charges he of course did still take part and set some things in motion. And of course he's going to have to live with that. But as far as like being criminally um, responsible, he's cleared of that. However, the judge in the case makes an interesting judgment in that he's permanently barred from holding a flag rank. So, you know, Admiral, any rank like that, how did uh, that decision, how did you reach that decision with regards to Picard here? Well, the reason the presiding officer, not a judge, but a presiding officer, right, sorry. Uh, Admiral Marin Liu, essentially the presiding officer at a preliminary hearing, the preliminary hearing officer or PHO, is not there to render a judgment, but to render a recommendation. The recommendation, as Admiral Liu explains at the beginning of the proceeding, is not binding. The Starfleet Admiralty could have chosen to ignore Admiral Liu's recommendation and charge Picard anyway and put him on a general court-martial. Uh, they could have chosen to uh, impose any number of summary judgments. They could have subjected him to special court-martial, summary court-martial, general court-martial. There's a number of varying degrees of court-martial and, and whatnot. So what happens is, is that the evidence that is presented is exculpatory enough uh, that it clears Picard on certain charges. And the most important thing that clears Picard uh, of the majority of them is in fact an established factor of military law, which is that a subordinate is not legally responsible for the actions of their superiors. Superior officers are responsible for the conduct of, of officers and enlisted personnel under their command, it does go from top down, but it doesn't go from the bottom up. In other words, if I'm your sergeant and you're my lieutenant and you go and you do something stupid, you uh, I report to you that this and this is going on and you take that information and you use it and you go do something illegal that I'm not uh, a party to, I'm not culpable for your illegal act just because I provided you information. I am not legally culpable for the actions of my superiors. My superiors, because of the way military chain of command works, their actions are their own problem. I am insulated from responsibility for those above me. I am only responsible for myself and those under my command or direct charge. If I allow a corporal under my command to go off and do something stupid, then I'm culpable. But my lieutenant, I'm not responsible for the actions of my lieutenant. And that's what happens here with Picard. Picard is not legally responsible for what the Admiralty does. He was bound by oath, by uh, regulation, by law to report the findings of the investigation conducted by the officers under his command. He reported to the proper legal authority. That legal authority said, I'm going to run it up the chain of command to flag officers, and I want you on the call to basically verify the evidence and verify the chain of custody, et cetera, et cetera. So he was obeying the direct orders of a diplomatic officer. He had to obey. He had to do it. He had to be on that call. What the admirals do after the call ends is on them. Mm -hmm. The fact that they didn't run it up the chain of command to the Federation Council or the Secretary of Defense or, hell, even the uh, CNC, whoever the hell that might have been at the time, that's on them. What they do with the information once Picard hands it off legally is not his problem. So the fact that Picard walks away from all this 
legally it makes sense morally it might not seem to make sense but legally it does uh and that was you know sort of one of the fun things and the reason he gets recommended uh you know the problem is that you can't just let him walk legally there isn't enough basis here to charge him with any of the crimes that were put forward as the ostensible rationale for the article 32 hearing the evidence just doesn't support these charges and considering how exculpatory some of the later presentations are he's probably you know going to get exonerated at a general court martial and that's just going to be a whole nother mess of a proceeding to go through they don't want to go through that but they can recommend a summary you know a, a mark of censure can be put on his record and an order can be given by for instance the uh, federation of security council that picard's name uh, you know, there's now a mark in his record that says, you know, he is not eligible for advancement to flag rank. That happens. Uh, a captain who screws up, you know, uh, in a major way in the real life military, maybe, you know, if it, uh, depending on the circumstances, the specifics uh, of the case, et cetera, et cetera, maybe they do or do not get removed from their current command, but it is not at all unreasonable for someone to say, this is as far as you're going to go. Your career your career path ends here. Um, the card is useful. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you, you've got to do something. You got to make a gesture to support the rule of law. At the same time, the Federation needs its heroes now more than ever. And the last thing you want to do is burn down a hero as prominent as John Luke Picard. So you've got to do something that says he's going to be punished. There will be a price. There will be consequences but you don't want to hang them out to dry and you don't want to take away the people's hero. So that was how we arrived at the compromise of censure and uh, an end to uh, rank advancement for Picard, at least in the literary continuity. Well, he doesn't seem really disappointed with that decision because he really <laughs> doesn't want to be. An he, never wa he never wanted to move up anyway. This is the punishment that isn't really a punishment. Right. It, it really struck me as, as feeling similar to, uh, of course, Kirk's uh, demotion in Star Trek Four. Like exactly same idea. Well, it's an homage. The idea is that there are certain parallels between these two famous captains. They may seem to have very different styles of command, very different ways of doing things, but in the end, you know, they there are certain parallels that are going to follow the the lives of these great men. Excellent. Well. Uh, I, I think because I will probably get uh, harangued on social media if I don't bring this up, just because uh, it's it's something that I'm sure someone out there is asking. In the Picard trailer for the upcoming series, we know that he was an admiral at the time that he retired. So what happens in between then and now? I'm really curious. <laughs> the, uh, well... Either something happens that changes his political clout, or the two timelines are completely and utterly incompatible. I think that uh, that's what it comes down to, yep. The fundamental <laughs> thing to know here is that at the time this book was commissioned, outlined, written, and edited and sent to production, absolutely no details regarding the storyline, backstory, or development of Star Trek Picard had been shared by its production office with anybody on the tie-in side. Uh, even, you know, Dayton and uh, JVC, you know, John Van Sitters at uh, CBS Licensing, the editors at the book line. At the time I finished writing this book back in, I guess, February, March, it's probably somewhere around March. We didn't know anything. Picard, the, the Picard series was still deep into discussions, development. Uh, they were still haggling over core concepts. They didn't have their cast worked out yet. They had barely, uh, you know, gotten the ball rolling at that point. They were still hammering it all out. And they hadn't told us anything. We knew nothing. So that's a big part of why this book doesn't connect up or even make any effort to connect up with what we saw in the Picard series. Because there simply was no information available for us to work with at the time this book was written. So, mm, and and I, I suspected I, that. Was... And I was told by my editor, just go forward with the literary continuity we have. 
Don't worry about what they're doing on Picard. We burn that bridge when we come to it next year. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and that was kind of my suspicion as well. Um, if anything, I'm, I'm thinking Una McCormick might have something in her novel, but that's all well, just she, speculation well, well, on my part. <laughs> well, she is writing the first novel based on the Star Trek Picard series. Mm -hmm. She's supposed to. She has been brief. She probably has seen scripts. She probably is getting uh, a similar level of information and cooperation uh, as I received from the uh, Discovery team when I wrote the first Discovery novel, Desperate Hours. So I would not be surprised uh, to find that Una uh, has been sort of brought into the into the loop story-wise with the Star Trek Picard team. So yes, Una's upcoming novel will definitely uh, shine some light on things. And uh, I think there will be other Star Trek Picard novels in the pipeline. Uh, I think they're, they're already talking about them. I don't know if they've announced them yet, but if they haven't, they probably will soon. So that's coming. Be on the lookout for that. Um, but as far as what we're doing with the rest of the literary continuity, to be perfectly honest, we haven't decided. We've had some chats. We've bandied some ideas. We've talked about some possibilities. But nothing is set in stone. No contracts have been drawn up. Nothing has been commissioned. Um, so, yeah, right now, nobody's under contract for anything more on the ongoing literary continuity. All we have are some ideas that are intriguing to us, but we haven't decided yet what to do with them. Well, I can't wait to find out with everyone else what those are. I'm really excited. So, Me too. Um, yeah, I guess all that's really left is uh, if there's anything else you wanted to talk about with this novel, and if not, where can people find you and what might you be working on that our listeners might be interested in? Well, you can find me on the web at a lot of different places. You can find my website, davidmack.pro. That's davidmack, M-A-C-K, dot P-R-O. And that has social media links to my Facebook page, my Twitter, and yada, yada, yada. Um, as for what I'm working on at the moment that your listeners might be interested in, I think the fact that I'm working as a consultant on two of the upcoming Star Trek animated TV series is probably the most interesting thing to them. Uh, the writing is done on season one of Lower Decks. So I, I've, uh, I've finished most of my uh, story uh, noting work for them. The writing is coming along very well on the first season of the uh, kids show being produced for Nickelodeon by the Hageman brothers. Uh, I don't think they've officially announced the title yet, so I'm not going to say anything about it. Uh, I'll just say that I have seen up through, I believe, the script for 107. Uh, so I've got three left to go uh, on season one. They're you know working on episodes 108 through 110 right now. Uh, big finish series finale, not series finale, season finale type of thing. Um, and it's just going to be really exciting. I mean, the thing is, it's going to take a long time, I think, before we hear any concrete news or get any solid announcements about the kids show, just because they are doing some pretty sophisticated 3D animation for it. And I'm told it's going to take a long time. So the kids show is probably not going to arrive on screens until 2021. Uh, yeah. is, is my best guess. And I can't even, That's I'm what not I've even heard sure as well. Uh, Lower Decks, I think, might uh, arrive on CBS All Access next year, but I can't be 100% certain about that either. Uh, all I know is that uh, things are going great. I'm really impressed with the writing on both shows. Uh, Mike McMahon and his team at Lower Decks have been fantastic. Uh, and the Hageman brothers and their team on the uh, Nickelodeon series are just blowing my mind. Uh, they are writing some of the smartest, best, most heartfelt Trek uh, I've seen uh, in a long time. I'm, I'm just really proud to be part of their team and to know that I get to help and contribute in some way to helping bring it to life. Excellent. Yeah, I'm really great. excited about those. Me too. I'm excited. I, just keep talking because you're getting us even more excited about things. What's coming in 2022 <laughs> and 23 and 24? Oh, heaven only knows. Uh, what I have coming out next year in 2020 uh, is the third book of my Dark Arts series. That's called The Shadow Commission. That comes out on June 9, 2020. And that's basically uh, three days of the Condor style conspiracy paranoia piece with black magic 
set during the week after the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. Ooh, that's going to be good. Ooh, excellent. And that's basically the uh, the series finale, I think, for, for Dark Arts. I think that's all there's going to be on that. And then in August of 2020, that's going to see the publication of my long-delayed Star Trek novel, More Beautiful Than Death, which was based on the 2009 version uh, of Star Trek produced by J.J. Abrams. Uh, that novel was written to be very specific to that uh, version of the universe, that incarnation of the characters, their particular backstories, relationships, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I was very happy with the way that book captured the tone of that particular uh incarnation of star trek and i'm hoping that fans who have enjoyed the recent uh bad robot uh star trek films will really dig more beautiful than death when it finally comes out next august excellent i'm excited we finally get to look at that because i i know it's it's one you've talked about being proud of so it's getting resurrected definitely. after a decade i mean i think it, that's pretty cool <laughs> i think it was originally supposed to be out in like 2010 like late 2010 and now it's coming out in in 2020 so you know, 10 years uh, in the dark and uh, I'm told it's finally going to see the light of day. So I'm just uh, pleased as punch, as they say. Awesome. Just out of curiosity, was there any kind of like touch up work you had to do on it in light of the two other films that have come out since? Or yeah, just, does it just a little bit? I uh, obviously okay. I went through to clean it up a little because as a writer, my style has evolved and uh, shifted a little bit in the 10 years since I wrote the manuscript. So I wanted to go in and clean up the prose and punch it up a little bit. I did have to go in and massage a couple of details just to make it track with one line of dialogue that's uh, uttered in the film Into Darkness. Uh, when Kirk boasts, you know, X number of years I've been commanding the Enterprise and I haven't lost one person under my command in that time. I'm like, you <laughs> son of a <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so there goes my body count you bastard so i uh <laughs> so I, I had to make some adjustments to the story and fix a few lines and uh adjust a few action sequences just to make sure that my book does not conflict with that particular boast by james kirk um but it was okay i managed to find a way to do it that did not undercut the dramatic tension of the book uh, and I was rather pleased with how that worked out. Yeah, we had in the comics, he lost at least a couple of lives before Into Darkness came out. And well, I remember that mm -hmm. line being said. I was like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> whoops a daisy <laughs> Yeah. Star Trek's is no stranger to continuity errors. <laughs> oh, oh, believe me, the, the series, the whole franchise is just rife with them. They go all the way back. I mean, part of it is that, you know, when you're writing a series, especially like you go back to first season TOS, it's like building an engine while the engine is running. You've got 60 or 70 percent of the parts. You've turned the engine on. It's starting to run, but you're trying to build new parts of the engine without turning it off. That's what <laughs> creating canon is like uh, when you're trying to get a show written each week. Uh, and then when you start adding more shows and movies to the mix, it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. Do you know there's a character Batmite in in Batman and and or, or like Mister Mixaplex or whatever in Superman? Like I'm picturing there's like a being like that that's going around the Star Trek universe it's and always Q. changing the timeline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm 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 talking about one we've never seen. That like, you know, I just think it'd be yeah. funny if you find out Q has been changing the like, continuity details when someone says, "Worf, didn't the ridges on your head used to look different?" Yes. Yes, they did. What happened? <laughs> and then in the background, you just see like Q lean into frame, do a little wave, you know, a little photo bomb. Hello. And then, <laughs> then he vanishes. Uh, I always maintain the entire Star Trek universe holds together perfectly, or my name isn't James R. Kirk. Yeah. Star Trek canon is always <laughs> consistent and in internally consistent and wholly correct. <laughs> <laughs> Legally, legally speaking, the fart noise has to be made after that statement. <laughs> I believe, yes, it is required. It's like a trademark situation. You, you have to make it. You got to put the little TM and then a. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first time we've had that on the show. <laughs> well, that you could hear. 
Well, that's true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, uh, these discussions are so much fun and I'm, I don't know about everyone else, but I am so excited for what's on the horizon. And the fact that you have a part to play in it too, is so very exciting. <laughs> yeah. I'm like the, uh, like, like Guy Fliegman said in galaxy quest, Hey man, I'm just jazzed to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking forward to this novel for quite a while, so I was very pleased to read it, very pleased with it, and very pleased with our interview with David Mack. Yeah, definitely. This, like you said, it's one I've been looking forward to. And we didn't talk about this at all, but the the cover style, they've changed the look of it. it it's not following the previous TNG book cover and title um, font and that kind of thing. It really, it's a throwback to the old series font. And this cover art is just gorgeous. I really love that kind of, I don't know if you'd call that pop art or something like that. I, 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 I'm not an expert. Aaron Harvey will probably get mad at me for calling it the wrong style, but it's just really beautiful. Yeah. And it's very different. Yeah. It's different for a Trek novel and you know, the, it's animated, which, you know, David just mentioned, we're getting that kids animated show and sounds like in a couple of years so dan that gives you enough time to uh produce a kid for the premiere <laughs> of the kids show <laughs> oh shoot you're right i better get on that <laughs> if it's you need to go call. right now I-, I can carry on the rest of the show <laughs> without you <laughs> well it's been fun talking about making babies today but <laughs> <laughs> maybe not maybe not <laughs> <laughs> no i love it <laughs> Okay, I'll try and do it with a straight face, because that is actually pretty good. Well, it's been fun talking about making babies today, but it's not the only (laughs) thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Earl Grey. But good discussion. Like, I love, (laughs) you know, talking about the science. And Joe, I love that you bring it up. Justin. I need to stop reading it. I'm sorry. I'm closing, doing Close my the final window. thoughts. Close and the window, you're all Justin. laughing over me. Joe, you need to keep all of this, this in. Is a, <laughs> this is an intervention, Justin. <laughs> okay. Close the window. Oh my gosh. Literary Treks. I talked to Bob Klein, who I had interviewed for Saturday Morning Trek. Um, and he's like, yeah, come on over. Let's go look through my garage and see what we find. I'm like, okay. So I drive over there and I was greeted to two, you know, those fold out tables that you have for like picnics, two of those end to end with like three boxes, uh, larger than file boxes and uh, like moving boxes size and just papers and folders that all had filmation on it just brought out. Standard orbit. I bought it. I, I, when it first came out, I played it for like two or three days and I went, what is going on? Am I, am I missing something? Is it just, I'm not a good player. So, and then I checked on the reviews online and everyone agreed that it was not a good game and we were all correct. And introducing our newest show, The Line, a Star Trek Picard podcast. I, I'm so honored that I was chosen to pick Picard and as a Next Generation fan, I mean, he was one of my favorite characters. And so I wanted to, and I know how he is extra special to lots of Star Trek fans beyond even just being the character he played on the on the series. And so I really felt a huge responsibility to try to give the fans something that that was enjoyable but and, and honored who he was, even though it was staying true to the fact that he is 20 years older. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit on your spouse and hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, Spotify, 
in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-r-e-k-f-m to get all of the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, a hearing to determine your culpability in the Tezwa affair, and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways you can do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks, and that will come right to us. And you can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TrekFM. Now, special for Literary Treks, we also have a group on Goodreads, where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as a currently reading section, so you know what's coming up for future shows. Plus, there are message boards with great conversations happening about all the books and comics. Just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads.com and click Join Group. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Chemutala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network and for being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. Now, Bruce, when you're not leading a strike team against some Nausicans with some officers that sound suspiciously like characters from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me in Queens if I'm not in Brooklyn. Or you can find me in the Babel Conference talking with people in the Bronx. And <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. You can find me on Live from the Edge with Brandy Jackula. Yes, every time a new Discovery of Short Treks comes out, we're there the next day or sometimes the day of. And you can find me on the Star Wars Report talking about Star Wars, especially The Mandalorian and The Rise of Skywalker. And Dan, where can people find you when you're not on trial for a cover-up that involved the murder of President Zeif? Well, nobody liked him anyway, and he was kind of a jerk, so no big deal. <laughs> you can find me tweeting about that on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. That's just Star Trek backwards. You can also find me on youtube.com slash Kurtratz Productions, where I make videos about Star Trek mostly. Um, all this new Star Trek that we're getting, I'm trying to do reviews of each new episode and all that kind of stuff. You can also find my website at treklit.com, where I review Star Trek novels, both old and new. And of course, in the Babel Conference, usually lurking, but sometimes commenting. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. What do you call that light reading? To each his own, number one.